Hello, welcome to the Curator Podcast. This is episode 35. Welcome once again, dear listener, to the Curator Podcast. I am your host, Mark Fraser, and this is episode number 35. A little bit late again this episode, I do apologise profusely for that. A lot of interviews seem to be coming through on Thursdays at the moment, which is a bit of a bummer, really, because this this podcast is supposed to go out on Thursday. But I guess that probably says more about my preparedness for booking interviews as opposed to the day on which they fall. I should probably have some interviews in the tank ready to go as opposed to just doing one on the day of the podcast but you know I'm not perfect and you guys know that hopefully so yeah I will hopefully be back to a regular schedule well not a regular schedule we'll hopefully go back to Thursdays as of the following episode but I don't know it's okay I think it's all right I mean if you guys don't like this if you guys are feeling like if it annoys you that it's late then please let me know it does annoy me when podcasts I like are late but I'm a weirdo, so, I mean, you guys might be okay with it, or you might not. Either way, I'd like to know. On this episode, I have an interview, a really great interview, with one of my favourite songwriters right now, is Alison Weiss. Now, Alison is such a cool person, man. Like, I always get a bit weird going on interviews because, I don't know, I get you get nervous, you know what I mean? And, and that goes to the same for everyone when I talk to them. I still get nervous, I guess that's a good sign. But Alison was just really accommodating and she was super fun to chat to and I really enjoyed talking to her. So hopefully that comes across in the interview and it's not too awkward or anything like that for you because, hey, I enjoyed it. I also enjoyed being back in the King Tut's green room. I haven't been in there for a long, long time and it's just as small as I remember. But um, it's not a bad thing. It was pretty cool, actually. So I am going to um, dive right into this there's a bit of a weird noise in the background which I tried to erase but I couldn't I think it's like an air conditioner or something like that so if you hear that I guess just deal with it it's not that invasive but it's cool once again I didn't use my handheld mic I just kind of used the mic on the recorder so it gives it a much more conversational flow which I like there's something really restricting about having to shove a microphone in someone's face whenever you ask them a question so it's good to not do that sometimes and yeah, I think it makes uh, the interview, the quality of the interview, much better. I also apologise for having a slightly scratchy throat. I was recording some vocals with my band over the weekend there, and I think I, I think I've damaged it in some way. And hopefully, it's not permanent, but I don't know, man. If it is, then that's some bad crack. Anyway, I'm going to open up this interview now with one of my favourite songs by Alison. It's called "Wait for Me." It's from her album "Say What You Mean," and I hope you enjoy it. <laughs> so alive I'm packing my suitcase and changing my mind I forgot what it's like to look the things you want right between the eyes it's never been so hard to say goodbye I'm back to the basics and waiting for signs praying for patience falling behind it's not the way I'm meant to be it's just how i'm designed i get so tired of running out of time i'm missing out on all the places i could go the people i could know the nights so not alone we'll never make it in it wasn't meant to be but i in my hands I wanted adventure You met my demands I told myself the day I left I want it but I can't I fell for something far away again I guess that it's pointless But I mean what I say I never expected Through all this time I could be okay Yeah, all the things you do With all my heart that I could stay I'm missing out on all the places I could go The people I could know The nights I'm not alone We'll never make it and it wasn't meant 
feel so alive. I'm packing my suitcase and changing my mind. I forgot what it's like to look the things you want right between the eyes. Say good. Alison, we're here in King Touch. How are you doing? Doing great. Is it? I guess the, the question that everybody starts off with is, how's the tour been so far? It's a total bullshit question, but I might as well start there. I know. Well, <laughs> it's day three, um, and so far we're having a blast. All the shows have been great, all two of them. You know, it's always a short run when we come over here because the country is really small, but we kind of love it because touring in the U.S., you're used to driving like four or five hours at least every day or sometimes pulling like a ten-hour drive before a show, so... Over here, it's really nice to just have like an hour or two between every city. Until you go to until you go to Europe, then it's the same. Yeah, then it's like, awful. Like 10 hour drives, yeah. yeah, but this one's just a UK tour. It's going. I think um, I've I've done the UK tour myself before, and so it's all right. I'd love to go to America though. I think. Oh yeah, that'd be great. But I seen a thing recently about um, how like, a visa for a band costs like like something crazy, like twenty thousand dollars. Holy shit! From here to go over there. I heard it's really hard to go into the states. Yeah. And that's such a bummer. Because for us, it's just, you know, our visas come with the contracts for the shows. So yeah. all it, it's, it still feels really expensive, but it's just plane tickets. But yeah, I heard um, the U.S. makes it really hard for foreign bands to come in. I've got a couple of friends that went over and played things like CMJ and all that. And, oh, yeah. And Fest, and they've just went over with a tourist visa and then, like, borrowed instruments mm. when, when they were there. See, that's dangerous, though, because yeah, if they like, find out, they'll, exactly. like, kick you out forever. Somebody, somebody once told me that uh, one of the security, one of the guys in the, in the border control had actually Googled the guy's name and yeah. found out he was on tour. I was like, holy shit, that's, like, yeah. that's crazy. Yeah, that's, like, uh, like, in the earlier days before I was, you know, doing shows where there was an actual promoter and there was, like, contracts involved and, like, music business stuff, um... When I would go and play Canada, it would always be like, just don't don't tell them you're playing music and try and cross the border. But then Google happened, <laughs> and like when you're like me and your band name is the same as your yeah. real name, it's so easy for them to Google and find you, and then just like ban you from the country for five years. Which I've known people who's that who that's happened to. Wow, so they're sweet. like, I'm just. You know, a tourist who happened to bring, bring my guitar, and then the border agent googles their name and sees all the tour dates. So is it the same? So it's the same trying to get out of the U.S. like to Canada. Then is it the same kind of? Yeah, yeah, Canada. Yeah, you have to have the you know the proper paperwork, or they'll turn you back around and ban you from the country. Man, I, I like the sound of going to Canada as well. I think to go there. Yeah. <laughs> I went to rethink that. What? I went to rethink that. Yeah, it's not easy. It's a bummer how not easy it is. I wish there was some sort of like musician visa that was like easier because you're not really going to work i yeah. mean you are going to work but it's not like you're going to go get a job and work <laughs> in the country and then no one's going to make any money <laughs> yeah right <laughs> <laughs> so um one of the things i was i was doing some research on you because I, I like to do research this, that's good this, this, that's what you have to do and uh it's kind of daunting because kind of daunting i guess is because you've done a lot of interviews yeah. So it's, it's really hard to try and find a new angle. Uh-huh, right. <laughs> but what makes it doubly scary, I guess, is that you also do interviews yourself. Oh, yeah, yeah. You Are you talking about the ones where I interviewed my, uh, like, producer and, yeah, and uh-huh. bandmates about the yeah. record? Yeah. Which, I guess, it led me to wonder, like, who would be, like, your, what would be your ideal interview to do, like, yourself? Ooh. I feel like um, I would love to interview... Uh, this soccer player for the U.S. women's team. Her name's Megan Rapino. Oh yeah. Um, football player. Sorry, <laughs> <laughs> but I just got into football, real football, not American football, <laughs> through um, the U.S. women's team who just won the World Cup. And so, a chance to interview any of those players would be cool. Because as a musician, it's like interviewing other musicians. I don't know. It's not as fun. I feel like as like somebody who's doing something completely different yeah. than what I'm doing. 
That sounds like it'd be pretty awesome. Yeah, either that or some, you know, awesome comedian. Like, I have a, a favorite comedian of mine. His name's Pete Holmes. It'd be cool to interview him. I don't, I don't think I've heard of him. He's real, real goofy, but really <laughs> funny. <laughs> For me, it'd be Prince. Oh, yeah. In a heartbeat, like... Dude, who doesn't... I, would, I wouldn't want to interview Prince because I would be terrified. Yeah. I feel like he'd just, like, you'd ask him something, he'd be like, no, just pass. <laughs> Not a good enough question. He did that thing before he released his new album. He interviewed some. He asked like five press people to come to Centre to, to Paisley Park, and he played the piano and he sat and asked them questions. And you can't record what you said; you're not allowed to. Oh. And uh, this, this guy was work, working for the Guardian here in the UK, and he asked him to go up and sing um, "Sign of the Times." And he was like, "No, <laughs> <Are> you crazy? <laughs> oh my god! You're Prince. <laughs> I'm not going to sing next to you." <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. That's, that's weird as fuck, man. Um, I, I was reading some of the interviews you've done recently because, like I said, there's some research, and I, this, this might not be an accurate quote, but I'm going to throw it out there anyway. Sure. It says, you said, apparently, that you like to thrive on productivity. Yeah. Is that, is that accurate? Yeah, Yeah, definitely. I mean, I'm, def- I'm the kind of person where if I'm sitting around doing nothing, I'm wondering what I could be doing instead. It's just... I don't know. I like to keep busy. That's really interesting because I'm, I'm much the same. Mm-hmm. Um, where do you think that comes from? I don't know. I, honestly, I feel like it's maybe nurture or nature. My parents are very similar. My dad's like the kind of guy who's just like always doing stuff and always getting into things. And that said, they they know how to party and chill as well as anybody else. But I don't know. I just uh, I like I like getting things done. Is that why you do like so many different things, like the graphic design and all that? Oh yeah, definitely. Yeah. Because um, that's like almost like a poly, like an, artist, an artistic polymath, I guess. Yeah. And you just get fingers on so many pies, sort of thing. Yeah, know? yeah, totally. <laughs> well, I felt like um, I recently moved from Brooklyn to LA, and that was sort of like an effort to teach myself how to just relax and do nothing more. Because uh-huh. there was, you know, I've always been so like involved in so many things and in Brooklyn it was just like you know I do design and music and I'm just like constantly working and I feel like it really started to wear me down and started Mm -hmm. to like take its toll so now I actively try and like force myself to just take those like do nothing moments you know so so I guess has moving made it easier to kind of unwind then yeah LA has a real chill vibe New York is very like hustle and bustle and like be out there on the grind whereas people in LA are just like a little more relaxed about everything that sounds like the kind of place I would dislike because I don't like to be too relaxed and turned off like yeah uh, like one of the good things about living in Glasgow is there's always something happening you know yeah it's, yeah it's, it's, yeah it's, cool. it's really cool you know? yeah um, but sometimes yeah I think my girlfriend probably wishes I would switch off yeah yeah <laughs> you know? yeah that's the thing I was always like on my phone or like uh, just like it's impossible to turn my brain off and not be like thinking about what the next step was but I think it's really good at least for me to you know take a second in the morning even if it's just like 10 minutes to just like have a coffee and look out the window yeah. you know what I mean because whenever I'm with my girlfriend I make a conscious effort to not look at my phone or anything and just like just that's tr- good just try and be chill that's but a good way to keep your girlfriend it's itchy though like, you feel, I feel itchy right you know, you know what I mean like, but doesn't that make you nervous that that you are so addicted to your phone that yeah, you're like, like this. where is it, where is it, where is it? It's so sad. <laughs> yeah, I know, it is sad. Just staring at screens all day long. It's uh-huh. Sad. I and once read an Onion article that was like, would you guys, are you familiar with the Onion yeah, over here? Yeah, yeah that onion. was like, um, it was like, study shows that human beings spend eight to ten hours a day looking at glowing rectangles. <laughs> That's definitely true. Yeah. <laughs> I think from the second I wake up, I'm looking at one until I go to bed, like, right? literally all day. I just love them calling them glowing rectangles, because <laughs> it sounds so creepy when it's like, you're just looking at a glowing rectangle. Yeah, it's, it's, almost, it's almost, like, invasive. It's yeah. Like, it's like staring back at you as well. Which yeah, is yeah. Kind of creepy. Yeah. Um, yeah, so, as, a, as, as someone that is, that is a songwriter, I find songwriting to be a very intensive process. Intense? And intensive, but intense. Yeah. <laughs> intense process. <laughs> And you've put out quite a lot of stuff over the years, um, so I'm kind of wondering when you finish a song or a project, you still get the same feeling you used to get when you first started. Oh yeah, definitely. It's like I don't know. There's, I mean, you say you're a songwriter yourself, so you you understand. It's like it's like this inexplicable feeling when you've figured out like the right melody and the right words, and you've like just finished a song, and it's like this neat little package, and you're like, oh yeah, it's like this 
I don't know, it's like a cool little creation that you just made, and so it results in like this. It's a very exciting feeling to finish a song because, the, like, sometimes the process of writing a song can be so intense and like painful, whether it be like emotionally or just because you're like, oh god, I want to finish this fucking thing. Um, so when it all like it, it, every I feel like every time it all falls into place and I finish a song, it feels like something magic happened. Like it was out there in the universe, and I like pulled it down and put it on a page. I, I always feel like it's a fight. Like I'm fighting with. Myself. Yeah. I find like I, I I don't know about you, but I actually find songwriting a very like ex- not just exhausting, but like frustrating. Like it, it winds me up so much. Like mm-hmm. it, I get so angry at the fact that nothing, unlike what you just said, nothing I ever do that I've ever written or finished ever feels like it is finished. Oh man! So you're like the opposite. Yeah. yeah. So, but the the process in the middle seems like it's kind of the same. Though. Yeah, definitely. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, yeah. It's it's weird. I, I don't like I don't like doing it, but also have to do it. Yeah. You know, and that's mm-hmm. it, feels, it feels like I've got a big chain in my neck. Like, oh man, you're like one of those. Uh, um, what do you call it? like a suffering artist? You're like I have no control. I have to write songs. I think I have too much control. And just, <laughs> I kind of just like, man, yeah, yeah. It's just, it's just, just, just take it away from me. It's yeah, abandon it. Yeah, get it out of the way. It's gone. Um, over the years, has that process changed? Um, yeah, I definitely like my my songwriting when I was younger and our earlier records was much more like very like fueled by things that were happening in the moment or like emotional bursts of energy. Um, which I think that just, like, because of the way life works out, you, like, grow up and you, like, learn to deal with your emotions better, hopefully. Um, and situations change. Like, I'm engaged now, and I write breakup songs just because, like, that's what I love to write songs about. Even though in my daily life, I'm in a totally happy, wonderful relationship. Um, so now, for me, it's less, like, what what's happening to me right now that I need to write about and more, like... I like to, you know, look back on my past and things that I have experienced and, you know, dissect them and try and, like, come up with new ways to write about the same thing over and over again. <laughs> I was once told by a therapist, no less, that the reason that a lot of people keep coming back to those, like, breakup songs mm-hmm. is the, the emotions are so intense and so easily accessible. Oh, yeah. You know, even, even if you're happy, like, there's still, for some reason, that even though that wound is closed, it actually feels kind of cathartic to reopen it again and ex- explore... Absolutely. It, you know? Yeah, and it's such a universal emotion, yet at the same time, when you're in it, you feel like no one else in the world understands what you're feeling. Mm-hmm. So it's it's a special <laughs> time. It's a special kind of torture. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> kind of torture. Yeah. Um, cause I don't know, like, it's, I guess it's a good, a good thing to maybe go into what this podcast is actually about. Mm-hmm. Um, so the podcast in itself is about creativity and passion, and uh, obviously with a lot of the stuff that you've done, it's your music is quite passionate, as, mm-hmm. you've, as you've just just ex- explained. Um, but obviously, creativity is a huge part of. Like, I speak a little bit about uh, that's in fact what I've just said is probably the most I've ever spoken about creativity on my own part. Oh yeah. Yeah, uh, in any interview that I've done, um, because I find it really interesting. I find people's creative processes like infinitely more interesting than than anything else really. Um, but I wonder, like, when did you first realise that you were a creative person? I have always been doing like artistic things ever since I can remember um I don't know as soon as I was a you know I was the kid who was always drawing things and making things and you know like building things out of clay or whatever so as a as a young kid for me it was all about like visual art and like creating things and um I used to make little movies and stuff like that it wasn't until high school that I got into music and then found that that was like the number one creative outlet for me but yeah I've just I feel like I was just born the type of person who wants to make stuff What was the discovery of music like when it happened? Well I grew up in a very musical household my dad played and had a lot of instruments around so I was always like aware of it it was always like around me I just and I I played piano when I was a kid because my dad gave me lessons but it wasn't a thing that I was like Um, personally invested in yet it was just like yeah whatever my dad plays music and I can play piano blah 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 but then when um, you know I got into high school and I started having things that I wanted to say and like songs that I wanted to write I picked up a guitar and started playing myself and I don't even know how to describe what it was like it was just like 
it was it was like it, w- it was always meant to happen i guess you know it wasn't it didn't have to it didn't feel forced or anything like that it was just like now i play guitar this is what i do this is what i'm going to do forever you know it's interesting that because you grew up in such a musical household that, that was the architecture of your life was already kind of like obviously instilled in you that that knowledge i guess mm-hmm. of, of music even if it was like subliminal mm-hmm. you know? yeah yeah um, it's, it's like the complete opposite to a lot of other people. I think a lot of yeah. people, you don't they don't really have that. But do you think that does that do you think that makes you different from other songwriters in, in some ways? I don't know. Never really thought about it. No. Yeah, I've never really thought about it. Um, I you know because I know people who have come from both sides of the coin. When somebody whose parents were songwriters or their grandparents were, and it's just like been a thing that their family has done. Mm-hmm. Um, and I know people who are the only musical member of their family or, you know, the first one to ever sing a song or have any sort of musical ability. So, um, and I don't really think, I feel like, uh, it doesn't, I don't know that it, that it sets me apart too much uh-huh. to be like fr- the, on the side where I'm from a musical family. Do you think that being from a musical family is, is one of the reasons why, like, you're a solo artist? Why I'm what? A solo artist. Maybe, I, but that probably has more to do with, you know, being OCD as hell yeah. and a control freak <laughs> and being, um, I've never been in a band where I wasn't the one who was completely in control, uh-huh. so it's almost like, I don't know what that says about me, but <laughs> I like to be the one in charge, I guess. I think that's cool, like, in, I don't think there's, any, there's obviously no right way of doing it, you know, like, you, yeah. just, you just do whatever you feel, whatever you feel is right, Yeah. And, but I'm the opposite, like, yeah. Although I like to be in control of the, the businessy aspect of it, just mm-hmm. because I don't trust anyone else to do it. Yeah. The musical side is I can I can't wait until it's we're in the room together doing it all at the same time. Yeah, collaboration is really fun. I just started like in the past couple of years writing more songs with friends, like my friend Jenny Owen Youngs, who's yeah. playing tonight as well. Um, she co-wrote a couple songs on my new record, and that's the first time I've ever had any songs on a record that weren't just a hundred percent all me, all mine. Um, and I love it. It's really. It's really nice. Um, I feel like collaborating with other songwriters helps me become a better songwriter myself. What was it like coming into that collaboration process when you first... Was it it kind of nervy or was it kind of... It's kind of weird at first. She wasn't the first person I ever co-wrote with, but definitely, like, learning to write with another person is... It's nerve-wracking when you just get into it because, you know, you... For... 25 years of my life writing music was this like really personal thing and I wouldn't share it with anybody until I was like confident that it was done and ready to be heard but like being in a room with somebody else and bouncing ideas off of each other you sort of have to just like get over all that stuff get over the ego of it and like not be afraid to say something stupid and that's like sort of my the way I look at it when I go into it and you know if I whenever I'm writing with somebody I'll say that at the beginning I'm like just so you know I have like a you, like a policy where you have to say everything even if you think it's dumb because like my shitty idea for a lyric might make you think of the perfect idea for a lyric and that's what collaboration is all about yeah. so I think it's just like say say everything and anything and any idea and let's get all the dumb ideas out and come up with which one is the best you have a saying in, a, in one of the bands I'm in we have the saying that song is king it's whatever, whatever serves the music song is king the song is king you yeah know, absolutely whatever's me. best for the yeah. song That I feel that way too it's like it's all about whatever's best for the song whether you're talking about the lyrics or the melody or the way it's going to be produced mm-hmm. yeah or the arrangement I guess is yeah, the, yeah, most, totally, totally. the most important parts of it um, I've just asked that question I'll move on to the next one um so side one dummy man yeah that's that's cute as fuck I love that label I love them they're so great they're so so supportive and just excited about everything and it's like I feel like not everybody can say that their label rules so hard like (laughs) most people I think have gripes about the record labels that they're on um but I just love side one they're they're just it's like I don't know they just get me. They just understand what I want to do, and they're down, and, like, I could call them up at, like, 3 in the morning and be like, I have a crazy idea, and then the next day they'd be like, let's do this, you know? So it's really, really fun to be on the way. That's really ace to have that support as an artist. Yeah, it's so great. It's it's so beats, you know, yeah, you could be on a major label and have huge budgets, but, like, I would much rather be on, like, a label like Side One where, you know, they're, like, a bigger... They're bigger in the punk scene, but they still operate like a DIY indie indie label, you know? Yeah, they have an office in Hollywood and, like, a staff and all that sort of stuff, but, like, I don't know. They feel like a little punk label, even though they're they're bigger. 
Was that a no-brainer then when they came calling? Was it like, yes, straight away? Yeah, totally. They had been... We had been, like, pals ever since my the previous record came out. See what you mean? Um, and the publicist that signed one, her name's Jamie Coletta, she's always been, like, such a champion of my songs, and, you know, she was always putting them on mixtapes and telling people about them, even though I wasn't even on that label. Um, and so then when I was looking for a new label, they were immediately, like hands in the air like uh oh, we'd like to put it out we'd like to put it out and yeah it was just it was like duh <laughs> um so i guess you are a full-time musician that is that's what you do mm-hmm. um going on a label like side one dummy is that like is that in your mind is that does that qualify as success um yeah i mean i think being able to pay my rent by doing what i love qualifies as success um which i can pretty much do so <laughs> yeah I think that everybody's got, you know, different levels of, like, what is the thing that is successful, but I feel, I totally feel successful, you know, I feel like I'm in fucking Scotland right now, um, getting ready to play a show that's probably gonna have a good amount of people at it, like, how crazy is that, that, like, I can come over here and play shows and, like, people from a whole other country, a whole other part of the world are singing my songs back at me, like, that's incredible, that's just, like, an incomparable feeling. When you were when you first started out, did you ever imagine this, did you ever imagine this was going to happen? You'd be sitting here talking to an idiot like me. Oh, I did, well, I dreamed about <laughs> it, but I didn't. You know, you never know. You when you're a kid, you're just like you see. Because I, you know, I went to a lot of shows when I was younger, um, and the bands that I would see were like like gods on stage, and I was like, oh, this is so crazy. How do they do this? And now I'm like in that world, and I'm like, oh man. They were just, you know, kids in their 20s, like I am now. This is so nuts. I can't believe that I'm, that I'm here doing the thing that I used to, like, look up to and, and freak out about as a kid. Can you remember the moment when you realized you'd become one of those people? I think, you know, it may have been when I started working with my manager, Joe Morrow, he, he plays guitar in the band in the early November, and that was sort of like a full circle thing for me because when I was 16 or 17 and just like playing music for fun in college, I got to open for them at a college show, and I was so excited about it because they were a band that I listened to as a kid and like would see as a kid, and I was like, oh, I can't believe I get to open for them early November. And then cut to like five years later, and now he's managing me, and like I, I'm like, you know, friends with bands that I used to look up to and go to their shows and I guess that's when I sort of was like, oh shit, this is when my when my last record came out, say what you mean and I was suddenly like in that AP scene, you know <laughs> when I used to go to the bookstore and pick up AP Magazine and read about all my favorite bands and then suddenly I was in AP Magazine I was like one of the hundred bands to watch and I was like oh, this is awesome I'm, I'm here, I've arrived yeah, <laughs> yeah, right that's awesome yeah I, I, I love hearing that kind of thing man because a, a lot of bands it's it's, it's never a process it's never like a defining line it's always like you kind of one day you, you think about something you're like oh, holy shit I'm, I'm here now like yeah when did that happen? yeah, right? <laughs> yeah uh, yeah, it's cool man like, hopefully that'll happen yeah. yeah. So the new album is awesome. Thank you. Yeah, I was getting some Cure vibes from it. Yeah. Is that? Is that? That feels good. That, I like that. Yeah. Is that? So that that was. I, I didn't know that was going to be in there because sometimes, it, like, you can say to someone after this is about this and they go, no. No. Yeah. Definitely. Care. I've I've like I love the Cure definitely for sure and that whole sort of like era of like new wave '80s stuff, um, and I've always wanted to incorporate more of that as well as like current pop styles into my own music and so that's what I did on New Love yeah I wasn't I wasn't really expecting it to be honest but when I heard it I was like man that's really cool I'm glad that you liked it I'm glad that you liked it because there's been a couple here and there like oh you know I miss the acoustic stuff but like I just I love playing these songs this is my favorite record I've made and who knows what the next one will be like but but for now this is what I'm doing and I love it evolution is obviously important to an artist yeah definitely and I guess do you ever get do you ever think about the times or are there any songs you don't play anymore because you feel as though they're you just don't represent who you are as an artist anymore yeah definitely there's some older songs on like my first couple EPs and records that just it's it to me feels like a whole different person wrote those songs and so and it's a bummer when people really want to hear those I need to figure out some way to play them 
so that they still sound like me. Like I, uh, a band I love called Tegan and Sarah. They have everyone a, knows Tegan. Yeah, everyone knows Tegan and Sarah. <laughs> they have a, um, I feel like a, uh, discography that is like that, where like their really early records sound like a completely different band than their most recent record. But their fans love the early stuff so much that they can't not play it. So they're really good at I feel like sort of updating their older songs to fit within the the realm of the newer songs. So that's something I aspire to do for sure. Uh, well, thinking about that is is that um, is that something that scares you? Thinking about you may have to do that. No, because I mean, even though the older songs feel like they're written by a different person, they're still me, and I still like them. It's just like it's more like a genre thing and an arrangement thing, where I'm like, oh, if I did that today, I would have done something different with it, you know. So it's almost like, um, like covering yourself. You know what I mean? Yeah. yeah. It kind of goes back to the, it's like what you were talking about, like when you used to look at bands like Ella November, and they were like your idols. I think that's what it comes back to for people as well. It's like I really want you to play that song because. I think a lot of times people don't see their favourite artist as being human, they see them as almost being almost like something more. Mm-hmm. Does that make sense? Yeah, definitely. And I guess that's, I think that's why a lot of people like it. I, I like it when artists evolve. I enjoy going on that journey with them. Um, and I, I do find it a bit odd that some artists can can get away with it, some can't, like obviously Boy could. But mm-hmm. like, there's a lot of artists, like, particularly punk bands, that like, if you change your sound, they're like, well, no. Yeah. Say, like, you've lost fans. Like, it's a bummer. Yeah, it's just. Does that ever play into anything that you do when you think about making music? Um, it hasn't yet, so that's good. That's good, yeah, that's yeah. the best way to be. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah. So, one of the things that I, I wanted to mention, because uh, it was an, an interview that I read a while ago, I think it was from a while ago now, but um, we should probably talk about marriage equality in America. Talk about what? Marriage equality in America. Oh, marriage equality. Yeah, because that's mind blowing to me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, because it's like, it's. We don't have that here. Like you we do, don't we, we have, do it here? have it here, but it's not an issue. Oh, oh, you mean marriage equality has always been? Yeah, well, it's, it's not. Like, it's not always been, but but when, it's, it when, was passed a long time yeah, ago. It's been that, legal here for much longer than it has been in the when United they decided States. That it had to happen. It happened. Yeah, yeah. It <laughs> wasn't know? like a whole giant issue. Yeah. Um. Yeah. I'm so glad that that is over with, at least from a legal standpoint. Mm. Of course, it's like now we're in the now we've entered the the part of it where probably for like the next five or ten years every time somebody has a problem with it they're gonna try and get the law overturned like the same way they are with abortion in america you know it's been legal since the 70s or 80s or something like that but people are always trying to reverse it the but abortion I'm, thing as well that's that's just scary to me like i don't i just don't understand why anybody would be against it really you know i know it's, i know it's a woman's choice like I know it's just, it's so obvious to us, yeah. but to the to the other side, they feel like their thing is their their opinion is the obvious choice, and that's where it's, it's just, just like how can it not be obvious? Like, I just don't. I, I can't wrap my head around I it. Know. You know? Same here. Um, but as, as someone, uh, does that does that play in your mind a lot? Like that they can kind of issue with marriage quality and stuff like that in America. Um, the acceptance of it, I guess. What do you mean? Like the acceptance of it from because there's obviously there's a lot of people that are opposed to it because. Of whatever bullshit views they hold, you know. Yeah. Is that is that something that is that a reality you need, you have to like you have to co- confront on a daily basis? Um, I think because I live in California, which is a pretty um, liberal state, um, it's not something that I really because you know California has it, it was legal there for a while and then they overturned it and that's when the whole thing started up again. Um, but. You know, it's only really when I'm on tour and I go to, like, the middle of the country where I'm, like, a little more nervous about <laughs> holding my fiancé's hand in a random gas station in Virginia or something yeah. like that. But um, I, I'm always, you know, on the Internet very uh, outspoken about yeah. my views. And, That's why I asked. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So I guess, yeah, I guess it does affect my day-to-day life in that way because I feel like being, like, a quote-unquote public figure... I I have like a sounding board and there's people who are listening and I feel like it's my responsibility to use that to to spread awareness and and help the kids who are like me that maybe don't have the luxury of coming out because yeah. they live in that small town in Virginia or whatever. It's absolutely I think it's absolutely required that people that are that have got, you know, public I guess knowledge, people know who they are. Yeah. They do take stands on things like that because Without them, then we're just going to go backwards. Yeah, exactly. And really, 
in parts of America it's already quite backwards it would seem oh it's so backwards <laughs> in some parts <laughs> um, but this kind of feeds into another question of, like, I've, had, I've had some trouble um, I've had a little bit of trouble over the past this podcast has been going since June last year and it's been really difficult for me to get women to come on the podcast oh yeah at the start it was it's now easier now that I've had some women on it yeah um, but a lot of things I, was, I have a knowledge that I have is that well I think it's probably quite right for a lot of women to be wary of talking to, to journalists because there's been a lot of stuff coming out recently about guys being quite misogynistic you know, oh yeah and, and, as music journalists particularly in America it would seem yeah um, and it, it makes me really sad that sexism is still a huge thing in the mm-hmm. music industry when it's supposed to be a liberal, pl- liberal place I know you know um, which has just made me go off on a weird tangent in my head there which I'm going to mention but speaking of being liberal the whole thing where the Eagles of Death, Eagles of Death metal singer talking about guns did you see that? No, I didn't see that. He just, they just played, they played Paris recently again. Oh, wow. And uh, he then they gave an interview saying, everybody needs to have guns. Everybody, everybody needs, needs to, to have, have guns. guns? After that, everybody needs to have guns. And I'm like, man, come on, like, do you not understand the... That's, that's why we've got this situation in the first place, man. That's awful. Yeah. Yeah. But nobody really understands. But being in the music industry, I guess those things are kind of... Those issues are more apparent than they are in, in real life. Does that make... Does, do you know what I mean? You mean like the sexism issues? Yeah, yeah. Um, it's definitely a thing. Well, for journalists, I feel like um, I think it's right to be wary because like it's it's a, it's a thing. It's a big thing. Like girls and bands still still come up against sexism on a daily basis. Yeah, yeah, it's just women get written about in a different way than, yeah. than guys get written about. Um, you know, whether it's something simple as being called a songstress rather than a songwriter, mm-hmm. um, or you know, something where you like, um, like I love Taylor Swift talks about how people give her so much shit for writing breakup songs. They're like, oh, she's just a girl writing breakup songs. And there's Taylor Swift with all her breakup songs again. But every guy everywhere writes breakup songs yeah. and no one gives in, like, no one gives John Mayer sh- or Ed Sheeran <laughs> shit about writing, yeah. like, their breakup songs. But when Taylor Swift does it, everyone's like, oh, another breakup song from Taylor Swift. Like, why aren't people questioning the dudes and saying who's this about who's that about um so yeah it can definitely be frustrating because it's like um and and people think of it as like a talking point too like ooh a girl musician it's crazy <laughs> a girl musician I can't believe those girl musicians man like when, when did that happen <laughs> I know right and I know that um um uh Lauren I think her name is from Churches yeah, yeah. who's from here uh-huh. she's very outspoken on the internet about sexism in the industry because I know she experiences a lot of it because she's a bigger band and the bigger you are the more trolls you have on the internet and especially because you know I, I feel like too when you're more feminine and you like you're, when you're tr- an attractive girl you like can't, like no one takes you seriously and it sucks mm. she I don't know if you know but she um, was responsible for setting up a, collect- a feminist collect- musical arts collective in Glasgow called TYCI cool she started up when she was in university before churches and uh, they are I knew about that she's yeah. like she's always been involved in the punk scene yeah yeah and she, churches is just like this awesome fun electronica project yeah I mean it's it's good to see that kind of thing I was actually um, today I was actually at a, a charity event um, and there was a sort of YWCA stand there and I was talking to them about it and they were all wearing t-shirts which uh, like obviously it's all, they're all about like um, not just empowering young women but like uh sort of dealing with the issues that they come up to on a daily basis and also try to get them to work in the house and all that if mm-hmm. they're facing you know, issues with that kind of thing. And they were all wearing different t-shirts with, which said like quotes in the back like all they ever asked me is like when are you going to get a boyfriend? Oh my and God. stuff like that. And, you know, and uh, when I just seen that at the back of that t-shirt even though like obviously like I, I came from a single parent family so like I've, I've seen I kind of seen it a bit of it like from a governmental level as well you know yeah. and just seeing that I just kind of ham- I think that was probably the whole point Hammer's whole point is like it's still such a like even though it doesn't really affect my life so much because I've always treated everybody equal because that's mm-hmm. the way I was brought up but it's still such a big thing and yeah. it blows my mind every single time I come across it I'm like well how can you hold such draconian views you know it's scary and then especially with the music industry as well like, yeah it's, it blows my mind I can't, I can't get it I mean I've had friends who were on you know women who are on tour with other bands full of guys where the guys will like just 
you know, call them, like, sweetie and honey all the time, or, like, I had somebody who even said, a guy in the other band, like, smacked her butt while she was walking by, and she turns around, and she's like, don't ever do that again, and his response is something like, whoa, calm down, honey, you know, and it's just, like, the fact that that is still happening is insane to me, and, I, you know, I feel like, um, I've... I've not experienced that sort of thing. Maybe it's because I'm, like, a more androgynous presenting, you know, gay woman. But, you know, not... You, it's... You can't tell girls to not, you know, wear what they want to wear. Like, I, like the whole thing where, it, especially in America, rape culture, where it's like, well, she shouldn't have been wearing that short skirt, or she shouldn't have been out late at night, rather than saying... Hey guys, don't just don't rape people. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like I love. There's somebody made something where because there's always like when you grow up as a woman, um, you're always being told like make sure you don't like how to prevent rape. Don't go out late at night by yourself. Don't wear skimpy clothing in public. May, always keep an eye on your drink, etc., etc., etc. Somebody made it like a mock one of those where it was like how to prevent rape, and it just said D if you see a woman out on the street. Don't rape her. <laughs> if you see a woman drunk in a bar, don't rape her. If, you know? So I just think that's really funny because it's like women are always taught to, like, be on guard against predators when really it's, Predatory culture as opposed yeah, to... Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And I, I suppose that's, that's the best way to put it. Like, yeah. I can't... There's nothing else I can really add to that. It's, yeah. <laughs> it's, it's, it's one of those things. Like, it, it just... To think that if I had a daughter, like, I would have to, like... She'd have to come across. She'd have to come up against something like that in this, in this modern world. You yeah, know what I mean, like that's to me, that's that's one of the most terrifying things I could ever imagine. Yeah, you know? and uh, that's just... but you know, as a dad who like understands feminism, um, and and that whole concept, I feel like if you had a daughter, she would grow up with, you know, the tools that she needed to understand that those things aren't okay. Because there are so many women too who don't understand. It and you know, there's this whole ridiculous movement on the internet that's like, I don't need feminism. Yeah, I've seen that. Yeah, and it's 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 like th it's like those women are a victim of the culture mm -hmm. because they they're just accepting it. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like they're like just ignorant to the to what's happening yeah. all around them. And the irony is, the irony is, of course, like if it wasn't for feminism, you wouldn't be able to say. Yeah, right? Like, Come on. You, you don't need feminism? Feminism is yeah. like why you can do simple things like wear pants and not a dress. Yeah. You know what I mean? Or like ha go to school and have a job and, you know, do something besides work for your husband. <laughs> yeah. Is there anything else you want to say or anything you want to ask me before we finish? Um, gosh, we've covered so many things. You have? Yeah. Just trying to make it not boring. It's, it's, oh no, it's, it's not boring. <laughs> we had the fun, and then we had like the the, the intense, serious political part yeah. at the end. But you know, we're we're like sitting here, each of us preaching to the choir. Yeah, we'll, yeah. Well, hopefully the choir are listening. Yeah, <laughs> let's hope. <laughs> well, it's been a total pleasure. Thank you very much for talking. Yeah, to me. thank you so much. It was a really good interview. I had so much fun talking to her. She was just she's just a super intelligent and very very cool relaxed person and that's that's good you want to hear that I mean that, that makes conversation much easier you know when someone's relaxed in an interview sometimes you go in an interview and people can be a little bit guarded but Alison was, was pretty cool so yeah enjoyed that I hope you enjoyed it too I, I get a bit wary about talking about feminism because it's really difficult for me to understand what it's like to to experience life as a woman the, the trials and all this stuff, all this stuff that they have to go through, and all the stuff that they have went through, you know, and come up against sexism on a daily basis. I mean, I see it. I don't know how I'd deal with that if I was a woman. So when I, when I talk about it, I feel a little bit awkward. Like I kind of feel as though it's not my place to talk about it. But on the other hand, I feel as though it's important to talk about it because it's something I passionately believe in. I passionately believe in equality. That was the way I was brought up. My mum, my mum brought me up to to believe that everyone was equal and everyone deserves the same thing, you know, and deserve the same chance in life and I've always believed that. Yet whenever I talk to a woman about feminism, even my girlfriend, I, I, I find it really difficult because I feel as though I'm, I'm I feel as though I'm an imposter almost. Does that make sense? I hope it does. So I hope when I spoke about that towards the end of this interview it wasn't too awkward. Maybe I'm just overthinking it. I don't know. It's possible. 
Anyway, thanks to Alison for talking to me. Thanks to Summers for sorting that out for me too. Um, going to play you out now with another Alison Weiss track from our new album, which is called New Love. If you get a second, please rate and review the podcast on iTunes. We'd really appreciate that. Feel free to hit me up on Twitter. That's the Curator Pod or, you know, whatever. Just let's have a chat. I love talking to people. It's awesome. And if you could share this podcast with your friends, then please do. If you enjoyed it, please share it. So, yeah, I'm going to play you out now. Like I said, one more song. This song is from her album, New Love, and it's called The Same. It's the last track on it. I think it's a total banger. So, yeah, enjoy it. Until next time, bye-bye. Is that it?